And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you live. Welcome to CCR <laughs> number 53, Climate Change Roundtable. Yep, it's Friday. And once again, we're going to um, factually impale people that don't listen to facts. <laughs> With us today, we've got our usual panel of Linnea Lucan and Sterling Burnett, and we have a new guest coming to us from Germany, who we'll introduce in more detail later. Her name is Maya, and uh, I believe the last name is pronounced Singwald? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Maya Singwald who works with EIKE in Germany, a television operation, and she visited the Heartland Conference recently. And so she's going to be providing some of her um, backgrounds and interest and observations on the conference and just the whole thing in general. Um, but what we're going to do in this particular show is we're going to review the ICC 15 climate conference last week that was held in Orlando, Florida. All of us attended and there were hundreds of attendees and dozens of presentations. And uh, there was a lot gained and a lot learned there. And so there was a lot of good side to it. There was some bad side too. We got some, you know, typical negative reviews, you know, where folks are calling it a denier a conference and all this sort of stuff. And then there was some ugliness as well from the uninformed and the folks that just simply think that we're all in it because, you know, we're getting paid by Exxon. Uh, raise your hand if you're being paid by Exxon. Nope. <laughs> None of us are paid by Exxon. But that's one of the most common fallacies about climate realists in that they, the folks that are on the other side of the story seem to think that we are paid to have an opinion, that we are not capable of original individual thought. And so obviously we must be paid to present what they call misinformation. We call it realism, factual realism, climate realism. Those are the things that we're going to talk about today. So um, what I want to do is uh, talk about a few of the topics that were covered at the show. I mean, we had political topics. Um, we had science topics. We had policy topics. Lin uh, Linnea and Sterling, why don't you give us kind of a, an overview of some of the things that impressed you the most there? Well, um, I didn't get the chance to watch all of the panels or as many panels as I would like to. But as you were just talking about, the the diversity of types of topics that we covered on this. I mean, there were there was more than one panel that wasn't just going over policy, but kind of the philosophy behind environmentalism and um, how it's changed over time. I thought that was really interesting. And um, how a lot of these, you know, so-called environmentalists have actually become over time anti-humanists in their pursuit of getting rid of carbon dioxide emissions at all costs. So I thought that was an interesting perspective that you don't hear from a whole lot of these sorts of gatherings. Okay, Sterling, what's your views on what was covered and what you saw and participated in? Well, of course, uh, like Linnea, because I was very active uh, in the conference. So many sessions that I'd like to have uh, been in, sure I would have learned something from, uh, I was just unable to attend. Uh, I was hosting, you know, moderating or speaking myself. And so now I'm actually catching up online, going back to Heartland's uh, videos of the conference. I advocate that our uh, audience uh, does that. They can see everything. We're uh, cutting them up in different segments so you can see them in shorter or longer periods. But uh, for me, there were two big takeaways. 
And uh, in part, it's because I was either moderating the panels or I already considered them to be the important, for me, the important topics. And they were uh, getting the science right because the whole climate, you know, all climate politics and policy is driven by supposedly scientific endeavors, right? It's, it's, they're saying, follow the science. And if you follow the science, we've got to act now. Now, that's what the science just doesn't show. And as we presented the science, you know, the climate conference, the temperatures aren't working like the models say they should. The, uh, the feedbacks aren't working like the models say they should. The uh, weather conditions aren't acting like the models say they should and like the IPC says they should. So if they don't get the science right, it's hard to build these climate policies. But even if the science were right, this brings us to the second thing that I found was very important. And, and one of the panels, a couple of panels I was on is the impacts of the policies themselves. You know, even if you think that there are some bad things that will flow from, from climate change, uh, you have to ask, well, are the fixes, you know, going to A, solve the problem and B, not be worse than the disease they're supposed to solve. And that's what we presented on. It's like, you know, I talked about uh, how green energy is causing slavery. We're encouraging slavery mm -hmm. and child labor. Uh, others talked about how it's causing environmental destruction in different ways. And, and the, uh, you know, the terrible impacts of these green, en the mining for the green energy technologies and things. So those were the two big takeaways for me. The science is not settled. And the policies are dangerous. Right. So anyway, if, if folks that are watching want to view the individual sessions, the keynotes, uh, the topics, and so forth, go to climateconference.heartland.org. Climate car <laughs> I can't talk today. Climateconference.heartland.org. And all the individual presentations and videos are there. And, um, you know, as one person just pointed out, that they really enjoyed the sessions. This was Albert Van Lingen. He said, I got time for some of the sessions. They were wholesome, honest, and based on common sense. And that's really everything that the Heartland Institute is all about. We try to, bake, er, to take these things that are complex and make them sensible, easy to understand, and root them in fact. And the folks on the other side of the equation, the climate alarmists, they don't like facts because they get in the, the way of telling the narrative. And we skewer them on a regular basis at climaterealism.com every week. You know, we, we take the media to task for having really crazy predictions that they go after that have no basis in reality. All right, so Maya, this was your first conference. And you came from Germany to attend uh, with um, the EIKE -E, uh, outfit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you thought was good at the conference and maybe something that you thought was bad, if there was anything? Um, well, technically, this wasn't my first conference I ever visited because we also organize conferences ourselves in Germany from the EIKE, -E, from the European Institute for Climate and Energy. Um, so it was actually pretty interesting to see, uh, to have a comparison actually from uh, like at the Heartland Institute that is also really experienced with uh, all of this stuff. And uh, it was a huge honor for me as well because I've met a lot of people that um, I've read a lot of books of, my, my dad as well, who's a geologist. Um, and uh, it was really exciting to actually see all these people in person and hear all the important stuff they actually have to tell uh, in person. And uh, these were great presentations to me. I see. So um, did you experience anything negative? Um, now, you had a, there was a cohort uh, a few years ago uh, by the name of Naomi Set. I think it's the last way you said it. Naomi Set. Yeah, and she had uh, attended one of our conferences, and she had spoken out about climate and tried to talk to young people about it. And she got raked over the coals by the German government and the German media and so forth. Um, have you had any kind of blowback for your participation? Um, I, I like for me in particular, I didn't have any blowback yet because um, we don't push my name into the open that far yet so I usually only see my face on YouTube um, as the presenter of our climate show on the German channel and also now on the English channel um, so we didn't like or I for myself didn't experience too much of that but 
as I said, we already hosted conferences in Germany, yearly conferences in Germany, and we always had some blowback from uh, leftist or Antifa on, on that page. So, yeah. Well, that's... now in private conversations uh, that we had, but not necessarily private, we had other people there, but yeah. we discussed uh, some of the blowback that Ike itself has already experienced. I mean, you've got a German YouTube channel. You're trying to... Mm -hmm. Uh, open uh, an English language YouTube channel from Ike, but yeah. y'all have had some, uh, the government has, uh, has gone after you, hadn't it? Yeah, we have been stripped from our charitable, uh, charitable benefit. Um, but it, yeah, beginning of last year, actually. So after that, our fundings have when they went down immediately, you know, we, we may, we notice it immediately. It was a huge, it had a huge impact on us. We're still trying to fight it. And, um, I don't know, it's a pretty difficult process because it's not stripped for eternity, but we're still working on it to like actually get it back. But during this time, there are less fundings because people don't get or receive their tax refunds for their what, funds. What was the justification? I, don't, I mean, I'm sure y'all's nonprofit status is very different in Germany than in the U.S., but as long as we're yeah. doing educational work um, and not lobbying, they, they don't take away our... our I'm not too sure anymore status. about the clarification or, like, the, the uh, explanation for that. Um, we just have... I know that um, the president of... Uh, Ike, uh, Olga Tusi is uh, actually working on writing expertises. It's just like banging expertises uh, back and forth uh, with the people that actually want to strip us of that. And yeah, it's just an ongoing, ongoing war at the moment <laughs> of bureaucracy, a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah, well, and you guys don't have the same freedom of speech protections that we have here. So is that something that's been difficult for you to kind of work around? Yeah, well, we have a lot of social pressure as well. I think that's like the biggest issue here in Germany, that the social pressure of actually speaking out your opinion and um, actually having your own opinion uh, is much more difficult here in Germany than basically than I think it is in the USA. Or as I actually also experienced it now in the USA as I visited your conference. Um, so it is a huge effort actually to really speak up and try to get other people to actually question uh, media, politicians uh, who, actually, who have a really high standard as well. And um, yeah, difficult basis to start off. So there was uh, a lot of interest in this conference. We had a lot of people traveling from all over the world, and we did get some media coverage uh, that was very positive about it. For one of the, the one of the best pieces of coverage was from another European outlet called, uh, I believe it's called Ace of Base or something of that effect. But they had a, a wonderful, a wonderful write up. Um, Ace of Spades HQ. There it is. And the Ace of Spades HQ had this fantastic article up, at what they called the Morning Rant, and they had this. I love this graphic, where they have the one of the things that was presented at the show that show how ice cream sales correlate with shark attacks. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, basically point out that correlation is not causation. I mean, one of the most common logical fallacies used by climate alarmist is, well, this is going up and this is going up and therefore it must be climate change, you know, uh, and they don't really sit back and consider that some correlations are just bogus like this. I mean, you, you think shark attacks and ice cream have anything to do with each other? Well, no, they don't. I mean, and, and sometimes it's the same way with, you know, they're one of the biggest ones with the media is they believe that severe weather is getting worse all the time they talk about it all the time and the problem is is that it's not really that severe weather is getting worse it's that the coverage of severe weather has exploded dramatically in the last 30 years because we've got people running around with cell phone cameras we've got you know live video storm chasers you know all this internet connectivity and so forth so well, tornadoes in the middle of nowhere that went completely unnoticed you know, three decades ago, are now right on the front page of headline news, you know, even the most insignificant ones. And so it gives you this impression that things are, are worse. Um, my uh, my dog's letting he, letting you know he agrees with you, Andy. <laughs> and Anthony. Uh, okay. 
He's chiming oh. in in the background. Is he barking approval or disapproval? No, he's he's definitely a, approval, or he'll be in the kennel soon. Um, I did, I, you know, this this graphic is so telling. Uh, it came from a, a presentation by Willie Soon, I believe. Uh, I was, I think that was the moderator. I was a panel a moderator on that panel, and you know, it, you think about it and you say, well, why would they be correlated? And of course, there's there's a, a logical reason for that. Uh, it's not causation, but it is correlation. And the correlation has to do with it. it you had a hot summer. <laughs> so you have a more people going to the beach. So more people in shark territory uh, means more interactions. You also have more people buying ice cream to cool off during the hot summer. So uh, there is a, an indirect causal mechanism for both of them but they have nothing to do with one another. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Um, uh, they're always trying to attribute climate, climate alarmists are always trying to attribute a particular weather event to climate change. You know, they got a whole, they've actually got a whole, uh, <laughs> I don't know who funds this stuff, uh, a whole think tank devoted to weather attribution. And they get, get I mean, a day after a hurricane, it passes, They've got a new report out as if they were yep. up, you know, all night cranking out this report that has no new data, no new evidence, but they run a computer simulation and there's a 30% chance this hurricane wouldn't have occurred or have been as powerful as it was had it not been for climate change. That's what our computer tells us, you know, and it's like, it's so much bunk. And that stuff is incredible, too, because the people who work at like the National Hurricane Center will say that they don't even have their data put together yet the day after a hurricane makes yeah. landfall. They're still working on interpreting it and making sure that there isn't noise and other weird stuff in the data sets that uh, that they're measuring live and afterwards. Um, so the idea that you can immediately attribute a certain percentage of the power of any given weather event to <laughs> anthropogenic climate change is, it's too stupid to even call it non-science. It's just corrupt. Yeah, there's a there's a phrase in science where something like that is, is described as not even wrong. It's so bad, it's not even wrong, and that's really what it, it, you can say about that. And then there's the seminal moment for not even wrong came last year during Hurricane Ian when CNN's Don Lemon was interviewing the director of the National Hurricane Center and then tried to prod the National Hurricane Center director into saying that, you know, Ian was caused by climate change. And when the, the Hurricane Center director basically pushed that aside and said, no, I don't really want to talk about that because it's not relevant, Lemon chimed in and said, well, I lived in Florida for decades and I know it's caused by climate change. It's just like, you know. I'm, wow. a, I'm, I'm a TV host, so I know more than you. <laughs> yeah. So my what how is it in Germany? How is it in Europe? How is weather being perceived by the media related to climate change? Do they immediately rush to it and try to assign it some sort of blame? Yeah, you also see when you talk with people here, you know, it's not only the media, it's also like the what people perceive when they see weather, you know, as soon as the sun shines, you know, and it's not exactly as cold as you expect it to be during the winter time. Of course, it's climate change. It's man made. Of course, what else? And it's uh, just being like people just perceive it immediately. You know, there's no questioning about it anymore. And that's what's scary to me, especially concerning young people, because I'm around a lot of young people as, as I go to university. And especially in the city where I come from, it's uh, difficult talking to people about that here. And um, yeah, just the what, what you were talking about, about social media and news being on like on track of every disaster happening, every like change in weather or sun comes out now, it's it's climate change, you know, it's just people pay more attention to it. I think that's the big issue. Like normally nobody would actually pay attention. Yeah. Uh, well, ahead, I think Sterling. it's, I think it's um, partly the 24 hour news cycle exists and everybody has access to it before, now. Uh, and the different, uh, media outlets have, you know, ability to cover things that happen far away through wires or, you know, satellites or whatever. But the other thing is it's selective. It's real selective reporting. So I've heard a lot this, this winter 
about the cold, about the warm, dry summer that Europe is experiencing. They say that, that Europe is experiencing. And it's like, and then they go and they talk about France and they talk about maybe parts of Italy and they talk about England and they say, oh, well, this is just, uh, it's, uh, it's awful. It's not normal. And they, they, they say Europe, but what they mean when they're reporting on this, I mean, what the evidence shows is that it's a small part of Europe. We have this whole part called Eastern Europe and they're not reporting on what's going on there. Right. Yeah, That's not important. Exactly. They're having a very unusually cold winter with lots of snow and, and disasters and avalanches. And somehow all we hear about Europe is really hot and dry. And it's like, no, half or more than half of Europe is not hot and dry at all. It's very cold. We're not hearing that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But the, also another problem is actually as soon as it's cold, people don't talk about it anymore. Like everything's fine. Everything's cold and cozy. We have snow outside. But as soon as the snow starts melting, people just uh, attack mm -hmm. right on it. You know, there was a huge heat wave back in, I believe, 2003 through most of Europe, and that included Germany. And I remember that heat wave, of course, was immediately blamed on climate change. And there were a lot of deaths associated with that heat wave, uh, partly because it was so uncommon for Europe to have such a large heat wave. But I'm just wondering, Maya, um, today in Germany and much of Europe, do, do people have air conditioning like they have in the United States where they can keep cool? Or is that still something that they don't have a lot of like in 2003? It's it's actually not that common here in, in Europe to actually have air conditioning uh, installed into apartments or hotels or anything like that. Uh, you see it in warmer countries, definitely, of course, but I'm not used to it uh, seeing that in Europe. So it's a it's fairly uncommon to have air conditioning. So if we experienced another heat wave in Europe, similar to what happened in 2003, you know, some natural variation kicks in. We get a blocking high, uh, keeps the uh, weather pattern from changing. And so, yeah, it's, it's likely that the, we would see a repeat of what happened in 2003, where a lot of people that didn't have air conditioning and don't know how to deal with the heat simply died um, because of the heat. Um, yeah, some of us actually only have fans, like they buy uh, themselves some fans and then everything's okay. And that's enough for the summer, actually, just to like whirl the wind around. But um, air conditioning is not common here, like for at least from my experience. Okay, so um, as far as, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about blowback, um, you know, with Ike and, and some of the things there. I'm just kind of curious. You, when I spoke with you at the conference, you said you had an interest in basically becoming the, the, the sensible and graceful uh, retort to Greta. Um, <laughs> why do you want to subject yourself to the surely what's going to be abuse from that kind of a position? Well, I'm not actually that interested in, Ge in Greta herself. I'm actually more interested in changing, or not actually changing, but moving young people, especially young people, because that's what's needed, to uh, start thinking more about things we hear, about questioning professors at university, because nobody does that anymore. And university was once a place where questioning was actually welcome, you know, questioning uh, professors and the science that has been taught, because that is how science evolved. And um, I have the feeling like we're moving way, way, um, like the, the, the way is part, you know, like we're moving way past that, actually, um, of questioning politicians, media, general opinion. And um, I want young people to see me and actually feel good about questioning things, you know, because it is actually interesting because what I saw at the conference and what I have been reading a lot of years before the conference already are actually really interesting facts because nobody actually uh, cares about them when you just like get read everything with, and, and accept everything media tells you. I, you know, I'm wondering, I, I just actually, while she was speaking, I just thought about it. I, I wondered what, what's happened in universities because it's happened here in America as well. It's not, it's not unique to Europe. Um, why, you know, when I was young, when I was very young, um, it was all about questioning the man, fighting the power in universities. Uh, people, if 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 uh, the government said it, students just you know, even sometimes unjustifiably just back like we didn't believe it. And suddenly, it's almost just the opposite. If the government says it, 
we, you know, we have to uh, toe the line, march in lockstep and believe it. Uh, how they came to trust and why professors uh, uh, changed the way they believed about freedom of speech on campus. And I'm wondering, now that I think about it, is it because now so much of what goes on in university life is funded or helped by government, right? If you're a student who gets thousands and tens of thousands of dollars in loans, and then the government's going to forgive you those loans, are you really going to spend a lot of time questioning what the government tells you about things? Because government, it's not, it's not that they're, it's not that you see a direct correlation between your pocketbook. It's that, it's that this guy, these guys are pretty good, right? They help me go to college. <laughs> They're yeah. they're helping me pay off my loans. They're pretty good. So they're probably, you know, they're telling me the truth. I can trust these guys. I'm wondering yeah. if that part of it, I don't know. It's it's basically like uh, the trust in parents. You know, you never question your parents to actually lie to you. And that's what that's actually the same trust people have in the government here. Um, you know, you would never you, you would you think they care for you. They care about you. They do any, anything. um possible to actually provide for you in the best way they actually can uh, so nobody would actually try and question that technically so um from in my experience i i would say it's a mixture of that the trust uh, the undeniable trust in uh, government and as well as the uh it's, it's more easier to just accept what people tell you. You don't need to go down the rabbit hole and yeah, just like, right. if you start once, you have to go on with every next step and question everything else as well. And that's hard work, actually. So um, why start doing that if you just can trust people and um, to do that for you? Better, better a pig, a pig satisfied than a, a, a genius <laughs> unsatisfied, right? <Rather> than <laughs> a philosopher unsatisfied. One of the things I'm interested in is a comparison. Since you're of similar ages, Linnea and Maya, um, as a comparison with your upbringing and education, um, Linnea, I know you've talked about in the past. We've had the indoctrination process about climate going on in schools. I'm wondering if the same kind of thing happened in Europe. So can you two guys talk about your experiences associated with education and, and, and the climate change issue? Sure. I mean, I went to public school, and I'm not exactly convinced that it's not just as bad in the private schools for the most part anyway. But um I mean, since at least seventh grade, probably before that, but seventh grade is when they really hit us hard um, with the climate stuff. I think the majority of my year in seventh grade was spent on climate stuff. I had these two teachers who would tie pretty much everything that we talked about in class, whether it was our math class or English, uh, they would tie it to a climate related thing. And this is around the same time, I think, as the... Um, Times photo with the polar bear standing out on the iceberg um, was making its rounds. And so we had all sorts, you know, it was reduced, reuse, recycle, which is fine. Um, but then they would take that and run with it. And they would say, well, no, you, if you have any questions whatsoever about, well, are polar bears actually dying out because of this? The numbers don't appear to say they are. Um, that was unacceptable. Um, I got some pushback from my teachers whenever I would kind of ask these sorts of questions and probe and prod. It got a little bit better in high school. I got lucky and I had some very good professor or teachers who were more than willing to engage um, and let you explore the information on your own. But I think that my experience with that is actually pretty unique for a lot of students. Um, the the curriculum is built into all of the textbooks. I don't think that there is a biological sciences or a physical sciences textbook out there that is being given to high school students that does not have climate change uh, lectures in it. So I, it's absolutely everywhere here. Maya, what's your experience with uh, education and climate? The thing is, usually as a student, you get these textbooks Linnea was talking about, and you don't question these books because you, your job as a student is to actually just learn what's written in there and just uh, 
throw it all up when you actually need the uh, needed in, in a test, for example, when you're being proved by by your teacher. And um, I, for myself, I just, I still remember my school actually also um, wanting people or leading people or leading students uh, to almost go to Fridays for Future demonstrations. And my dad actually fought a lot against it. He was uh, very active in um, like working against all these propaganda uh, taught at school because like sometimes even the teachers didn't even know better. And um, for him, it was a really important job as a geologist and him being into that topic for a really long time. And that has impacted me as well because um, I, for myself, I also learned to also have my own opinion and it being okay because the pressure in school of course it's high you have a lot of peer pressure as a student um, and you need to learn to detach yourself from that basically but um, yeah the most uh, or disappointing thing about that is that what I, as I already said teachers often really don't even know better and are actually surprised if you um, provide them with information that tells them otherwise yeah, and that's that's something that um, I want to emphasize is that teachers teachers don't know any more or less than what the average person does on these subjects necessarily. Um, a lot of the time, they know what's given to them in their lesson plan, and that's about it. They don't really do too much outside of that, and that is a hard lesson for a student to learn. It takes you know, a student knowing something very strongly outside of school and then having a teacher say the wrong thing in school for them to all of a sudden realize, oh, my teacher doesn't know what she's talking about or whatever it is. But if they never have that experience, then by the time they do realize, you know, usually once they're in college and they have friends who are training to become teachers and they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, there's there, there's no, you know, special class of intelligence that leads you to do this. It's a, you know, there are a bunch of different reasons why you go into teaching. You just have a passion for helping students learn, but it doesn't necessarily make you, you know, a climate change expert or something. And you shouldn't expect them to be, but they also should not then go and say, you know, there's nothing to challenge in the textbooks that were given. Um, I'm kind of meandering a little bit here, but my, my too long didn't listen. Teachers don't necessarily know it all, but sometimes it takes until a student becomes an adult before they realize that. And by that time, the lessons that they have been incorrectly taught have already set in. So it doesn't make much of a difference once they realize it later on in life. So I think it's helpful for the kind of work that Maya is doing to try and reach students, you know, before they are already adults out in the world um, doing things with their lives that are influenced by the incorrect stuff that they're learning in school. Yeah, we also receive a lot of comments on our YouTube channel that the, the videos we actually produce should be shown in school because um, people are learning or like they are simply accepting everything they, bring, uh, they are being taught by their, by their teachers and it's dangerous. And I'm always happy to see those comments because that's actually one of where I want to get at. I really want to get out to the, to the young people. And uh, I just saw on our um, YouTube metrics that, yeah, we are like over 60% uh, or over 60% of our viewers are actually above 55 years old. So that's, Nice, of course, um, but I actually saw a change already in the demographic um, within our metrics uh, since I started actually uh, presenting on YouTube because I started one over one year ago and it was a really nice handsome man that was presenting it, but uh, I think there's still a difference in a younger girl um, acting as a presenter and trying to get information out there, especially to uh, people the same age as I am because I think that's the important thing where we really really need to get at the young people because they are a future and um it's sad I I'm really sad actually for this generation uh that they're evolving in this way as they are right now okay so we've talked a little bit about some of the good things that we saw at the conference we've talked about some of the bad things that we've seen at the conference or about the conference some of the hit pieces uh, that, you know, basically call us the Climate Denier Conference of 2023 or things like that. Uh, but we're not. 
the Heartland Institute and the people that are involved that attend these conferences, they're interested in facts. They're not interested in rhetoric. They're not interested in the narrative. They want to find out for themselves. They want to look at the real data. They want to look at what you know, the data tells you. They're not interested in what the climate model projections are all about because they know climate models have this garbage in, garbage out reputation. But one of the most hilarious things that we'll call the ugly came from the website called the Daily Kos, K-O-S, which is short for the Daily Cossack. And, uh, you know, of course, it's a communist, you know, socialist type website. But there's this guy here, Alan Singer, who's an historian. You know, he was a teacher in New York City and an historian. And of course, now he's an expert on climate change. And so he started talking about the book that we started putting out just before the conference that we sent out to 8,000 uh, 8, copies we sent out to schools nationwide in the United States just before the climate conference. And so he started talking about the climate denial for the classroom because we have a book that is full of facts. And I wanna go to the, the first paragraph here where he says, the Heartland Institute sent copies of its two page climate denial pamphlet climate at a glance to 8,000 middle and high school teachers. Its goal is to influence what gets taught in the classroom by providing material for lessons that purport to show the earth is not going to be experiencing a climate crisis. I will point out that the word climate crisis or the phrase climate crisis did not exist a few years ago. It's a construct. It basically is a marketing tool. But the most interesting thing about this is this guy goes on, you know, to start talking about how bad the book is and how, you know, we're taking money from fossil fuel companies and blah, 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 the usual lazy argument. Well, this is the book right here, okay? It's a book. It's It's got thickness to it. And he says it's a two-page pamphlet. That was the press release, you bonehead. <laughs> the book has multiple pages. Now, obviously, this guy never read the book, never picked it up, never looked at it. And he's basically become an expert on it. And it's it, it just hilarious how bad, how ugly this sort of rant about us trying to get facts out. And I will point out that this book, uh, Sterling edited it, and I'm a co-author, mainly the lead author for it, is full of facts. And these facts are not something we pulled out of thin air. These facts are from government agencies, peer-reviewed research, and other factual references where we show you folks that, no, there is no climate crisis. Yes, it's gotten warmer. There's been a modest warming over the last century. Yes, sea level has arisen. But these are all things that have been happening normally and naturally since about 1850. And they are manageable. You know, yeah. New York City hasn't gone underwater. Boston hasn't gone underwater. But the, the, the folks like this guy, Alan Singer at the Daily Coast, are just absolutely convinced the earth is going to hell in a handbasket and we are evil for even questioning it. And that's the big gist of all of this. It's just we get pushed back on a daily basis just simply for talking real fact, like you guys, Linnea and Maya pointed out. When you start talking facts, it causes their heads to explode. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we counter this I, rampant non-factualism out there? Go ahead, yeah. Sterling. Well, I'd first like to say the last uh, clause in his paragraph, in his first paragraph, I, he he actually captured something right. Reread that last clause, right? He said, we're trying to persuade, something like this, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, we're trying to persuade, Heartland is trying to persuade students that, we are not facing a climate crisis. And I think that's a fact, you know, I think that's a, that's a fair assessment of what we're doing in this book. Um, we're presenting facts that say we, we never, nowhere in there do we say climate change isn't happening. We don't say that. What we say is that the climate change we're experiencing based on data, which we reference, anyone can go check our references. Um, it doesn't appear to be a crisis. In fact, some things are getting better and we can't find a lot of things that are getting worse. And that's what the data shows. All the claims of climate crisis 
uh, the you know the whole new uh, industry that's built up around the idea of a climate crisis um, comes from uh, the belief that IPCC statements based on computer models uh, of future conditions based often on um, you know emission scenarios that are impossible, uh, will come to pass and that they will do and that the climate will do exactly what they say it's going to do as if there are no chaotic elements in it, as if they understand how the different feedback mechanisms, what they are, you know, which things are different feedback mechanisms and how they'll operate. And none of that is true. And so it's, as Anthony said earlier, it's garbage in, garbage out. You, you start with false assumptions uh, you, you then met, you base your predictions on incorrect projections of temperatures. You can't even get the basic thing, right? Temperatures. Uh, and then you say, and these temperatures that don't exist are going to cause all these feedback mechanisms that we don't understand. Uh, but we'll pretend we do and we'll assume certain feedback mechanisms. And thus we have a crisis and you better get on board or you're going to drown. I mean, you know, Paul Ehrlich and, and others, um, I think, uh, I forget who it was, that said New York City would be underwater already. Uh, you know, that, 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 that downtown Manhattan would have water running down the streets. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, that, uh, that in the 70s, 200 million people would die of starvation in sub-Saharan Africa, as opposed to the more than billion that came out of starvation in sub-Saharan Africa. They get they continually get their predictions wrong, and yet they're continually referenced as the, the people keep going back to them as if they were experts on something. The thing is, get on board or drown is actually a really good phrase because um, people get emotionally attached to all of these like climate crisis things and apocalypse thing. Um, that's why it's also actually really difficult to actually also have normal discussions that are based on facts and on, on evidence and, and anything like that. Because uh, people, it's difficult to have a discussion with people that are emotionally so invested into something, uh, they don't think rationally anymore. And I think that's the huge issue because uh, that's also why people like, immediately point with the finger onto us and say we are the big uh, climate change deniers or anything around that. They don't see the clear picture anymore. We're not denying climate change. We're just trying to say, okay, climate change is a real thing, of course, but it's nothing new. It's nothing new to appear and there is no big crisis or apocalypse uh, coming towards us and um that's the emotional thing like the big emotional and social pressure actually running around through our um society right right yeah that's that's the whole thing they believe there's a real crisis in the making uh they believe that you know the model projections are going to tell us the future is dire and we should believe the models rather than you know history in our own eyes um and so Sterling, you made a point about climate models, you know, not predict, predicting correctly. Uh, and they haven't. We've, we've had several different articles on climate realism, for example, talking about how science has finally figured out that the models are running too hot. One of the most common models in use out there was the RCP 8.5 scenario. Well, some scientists discovered, hey, wait a minute, if we burned all of the fossil fuel on the planet, we still couldn't get to the projections level of RCP 8.5. Yet the media picked it up because it was worst case, you know, because they love the whole it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I want to show you is go back to this graph on the Ace of Spades headquarter, where um, they had this graph correlating shark attacks and ice cream. And the this really kind of encapsulates climate models uh, in in one picture here, because here we go. Here's this this graph of um, uh, climate models and shark attacks. Now, let's say some enterprising biologist decided he could start predicting shark attacks. So imagine if the sharks didn't cooperate. They didn't go out and attack people like they're supposed to. But yet the climate or the shark attack models say, well, gosh, there's going to be more shark attacks and it's going to go up, up and up. And then look what happens. 
the shark attacks go down, and so does the ice cream consumption. <laughs> Point is, is that you can model anything, and you can make an input for it, and you can say, okay, for this period of time, it's gone along, and it's increasing. Well, this is the old tenet for forecasting back in meteorology. It's called the persistence model, where basically, you know, it's been cold. It's cold tomorrow. It's likely to be cold the next day. That's the kind of simpleton argument that's being made about climate models. Well, it warmed up today. It warmed up last year, uh, warmed up five years ago. It must be that we're going to see increased warming, you know, 10 years from now. The problem is, is that a lot of these climate models can't properly manage things like clouds, natural variation, solar factors, all this other stuff. They completely either ignore it or they do a bad job of it. And so we end up with these bogus predictions about the future mm -hmm. that just don't pan out. And that is the basis for alarm and this whole thing. It's always been about climate models. It's not been about, never been about the real data. I want to say the people who are persuaded by these things are the general public. Look, we have a bit of luxury, right? I'm paid to do research and to write about climate, among other things, but prominently, you know, most, most primarily climate. And so I sit every day, I get online and start looking at news stories and start looking at, at scientific studies. The average person that goes out to their job every day doesn't have that luxury. And so where they get their ideas of what's going on with the climate is from the news. That's not their fault. That's the reality of their life. Uh, they, they largely, when they come home, they don't want to get online and say, oh, I heard the world's coming to an end. I better do a lot of Google research on that and see if I find someone that refutes it. They don't. But the people who are promulgating this nonsense, this dangerous nonsense, um, I don't think they believe it. They see Otherwise, you way... wouldn't see Obama buying beachfront property. Exactly. I think, uh, or or Al Gore selling his television station to uh, uh, the people who make their money from oil. Uh, you know, they don't act as if they believe what they say. And so why are they doing it? So it's either personal. They think they're going to make money. They're, they're profiting from it. It's about power. They want power over people's lives. Let's face it. A lot of these people, the, the, the things that they're saying we should do, uh, get rid of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, one of the things that we talked about in at ICC 15, right? That will cause people to die. That will cause people to starve to death. And we have an experiment that we just had in, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka recently where they went all organic and food production dropped by 50% in one year. In one yep. year. It was 30% in just the first six months. Yeah. And just... riots. Yeah. Riots in the streets brought down the government. I'm not talking about people storming the Capitol and putting headdresses on and sitting in seats. I'm talking they burned down the president's home. <laughs> um, so that's what they want, though, because they regularly write. There are too many people on Earth. And so oh. so they want to get rid of a lot of people. And these are these are the ways to do it. There you go. Yeah. Another correlation. Climate change causes more riots about climate change. <laughs> That's Anthony, you make that joke, but I have literally read journalism, you know, articles in major papers like Bloomberg that makes that claim that climate change is causing increasing civil unrest. And they yes. do, and this is this is unforgivable to me from journalists. They'll go and they'll see um, this is something we write on all the time at Climate Realism, uh, to the point of insanity. Um, and so Sterling especially knows because he and I hit the uh, crop production beat pretty much a couple times a week. But constantly in major you know, in major publications, you will have a journalist who will go and they will go to a state or a part of a state. They'll go somewhere that is suffering from a crop failure due to some kind of a weather condition or pests or whatever it is. And then they will go and they will say, this is because of climate change that, you know, there's a drought in Kansas and their wheat crop is down. 
Well, it takes about two seconds to go on the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN's website, look up the crop production of wheat in the United States over time and see that it has been rising steadily, despite the fact that we've been warming for more than 100 years. Um, it is. It would take the journalist no effort at all to pause for a second and think, does this actually make sense in the context of the data that's available? To look it up and say, no, it doesn't. But I can write a good piece on how these farmers are struggling with crop failure in one part of the world or another at one time or another. And as we said earlier, the the resolution of coverage of disasters of all kinds is the highest it has ever been. If you want to look, you will find a crop failure somewhere in the world at any given time. And, and all of that is available to you within three seconds of opening Google. Right. And what Let's they do with that... That's yeah, and, stays available, right? Yeah, and what they do with that is they say, "Well, look, um, fifty years ago, you didn't have multiple crop failures showing up in the news all the time at the same time. There are worldwide crop failures happening because of climate change. No, <laughs> it's because our coverage of it is so much wider than it's ever been. And I think, um, you know, it's hard for me to believe that a journalist doesn't recognize that that's what they're doing." unless they are just totally oblivious, which I don't know, some of them might be. <laughs> so, some, sometimes it's even worse than that. Um, I wrote about, a, you know, I wrote a story this week about coffee production, right? And in the, in the headline, it says coffee production down 50%. And I thought, well, that's not right. I, I know for a fact that's not right. And then the subhead is experts say coffee production has declined 50%. And I thought, oh, God, I'm interested in who these experts are. You know, is it a kid that doesn't get his coffee? I don't know. Uh, and so I went and looked. And in fact, the rest of the story didn't say that. They didn't cite a single expert who said that. What, what he referenced is a study by uh, the American Development Bank, I think it was, that said in the future, if we don't do something, climate, the, the area coffee is grown on might decline by 50 percent now even that doesn't necessarily mean coffee production declines 50 percent but nowhere in the story and i thought hold it so the reporter doesn't understand anything but also his editor just didn't catch the difference between saying it has declined to a study saying land area might Sperling, decline. i That's bet it's i bet it's a lot worse than that because a lot of these major publications you don't write your own headline right like it's the it's the editing board or the the what do they call it uh, the city room, or yeah. something that decides on the headlines of the articles that they receive. So it is someone. It is likely a combination of multiple people looking at a story and saying, "How can we tie this to climate change, or how can we hype this for the climate change catastrophe perspective as best as we can?" And then they run with it. And the journalist who wrote the story who hopefully knows that what they wrote was not what the headline shows, doesn't care. They let it go anyway, and their name is on it. I, I, that is astonishing to me. But if, they're, if their entire goal is to frighten people about climate change, then I guess they'll do anything. Yeah, the word Maya, experts Maya. also has become too overrated, actually, in the, in the media. <laughs> That's exactly I, right. I, cannot, I cannot take them serious any, anymore when I see uh, some expert appearing on the television because it's always the same. So, Maya, one of the things I wanted to find out is how, do, how did the German government react with farmers and fertilizer? They try to suppress them over there like we just heard about in Sri Lanka. Is there anything like that going on? Yeah, it's like Europe, I think the best uh, best example there is the Netherlands. Uh, you like you have a lot of newspaper articles on Netherlands where they where where they just overdo it with their regulations, and that will cause a lot of love of a lot of trouble there um, already. It's not that bad like in Netherlands, but we also have a lot of those discussions in our politics at the moment. Seems to me like you could probably take a position in Germany that climate change, you go and look at, at wheat yields, barley yields, um, 
hop yields, things like that, and say climate change is making beer better. I mean, that's really got to sell in Germany, right? <laughs> I guess so. Definitely. I'd be totally in for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that should be your point. Your point of uh, lead with lead with that every time. Climate change is making beer better. Beer Let's better, be happy. Right. You know, I'd write. I'd raise a beer bottle to that if I had one here at hand. But there in the fridge, a stein. <laughs> yeah, raise a stein. So tell us about your channels. Um, well, basically, we have uh, two channels now. We started off with the German ch channel, which is actually pretty successful until now. We have almost reached the 30,000 subscribers mark. And um, since I started hosting the videos, the viewers uh, actually went up as well. We had started with around four to 6,000 viewers per video, and now we always at least reach the, uh, the, the 10,000 viewers per video. Um, I'm myself, I for myself, I'm hosting the climate show, but we also have videos of our climate conferences being uploaded on that channel um, in the German version as well as in the English version on the English channel. This uh, shown here right now is the German channel with our 28.8 subscribers, a thousand subscribers. And yeah, as you can see here, a lot of videos from our climate conferences, a lot of uh, big names uh on different issues concerning climate change and of course our informational and educational videos on uh, different topics concerning climate change climate realism and uh, also uh topics concerning energy issues smrs dual fluid reactor reactors and anything that might come in uh, handy and is actually important in that uh in that range and yeah. so we also started now an English channel to, to upload uh, on our English channel as well uh, because we wanted to get out there. Like we, <laughs> we couldn't just say in Germany, we also want to inform people in the, the English speaking community because we are probably the only institute or think tank uh, that actually provides people with those videos and uh, quick information, also easy information. And so we started our English YouTube channel as well where we just uploaded uh, our first videos uh, from the World Climate News. Very humble name, of course. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, what's going to expect you. We're going to talk about manipulated data. Uh, this is about the glaciers melting uh, again, of course. And uh, we're also going to talk about different uh, things like uh, new, um, new records and nuclear fusion and anything concerning that. So, yeah, that's what's happening on our English channel for now. Not too much as on our German channel. We have a huge fan base there already, and we hope to be seeing that soon on our English channel as well. Great. That looks like a great resource. Um, we have a number of videos on our Heartland YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say, yeah, for the folks in Europe in particular that are looking to push back against this climate alarmism, visit the IKEA English channel and, and have a look. Um, so with that, we're almost out of time. Uh, we haven't had a whole lot of questions to put up, so we're going to skip the question and answer period we had originally scheduled. But I want to point out that um, we've really enjoyed having you, Maya, on uh, this uh, presentation today on our Climate Change Roundtable. And we hope to have you back in the future uh, related to topics. Of course. Yeah. It was a pleasure to be here, actually. It was a huge honor, and I was really happy uh, to actually bring my... Uh, my channel out there especially for the younger generation trying to do something about that and i'd come come again come back again anytime great great we Thank look you. forward to it me too all righty well then uh for maya linnea and for sterling i want to say goodbye and uh thanks for joining us i'm anthony watts senior fellow for environment and climate at the heartland institute wishing you a good day and a good weekend